In today's pres presentation, we will understand some historical antecedents of this concept resilience. So, in this con in this segment, we will be going to talk about the origin of resilience uh, as a science, particularly the study of children. We will talk briefly about some of the influences of World War II and about some of the pioneers who generated the early science on resilience. And finally, four waves of resilience. We may also explore resilience and its intersection and research evidences with a different discipline. And finally, we may understand some key concept which will help you to understand resilience further when you will study, when you will learn about the models in the upcoming lectures. World War II has a devastating effect on children around the world. The effects of war are most often faced by young men. Some women fight while most lose their son, husbands, fathers and brothers. Nevertheless, children are one who face the greatest loss. Many children were killed, injured, experienced starvation, the trauma of bombing and many other awful experiences. Children are innocent victims usually not knowing the reason for struggle and often too, you, too young to understand what is actually happening with them and what is the recent reason associated with it. Although completely innocent, they suffer most of the consequences of war. They were lacks of orphans as a consequence of World War II. Nazi occupied countries suffered the most. Schooling provided by Nazis in the occupied countries deliberately indoctrinated children with Nazi philosophies. Teachers were imprisoned in concentration camps, tortured and executed or used as slave labor. Children were punished severely for speaking their own language. There are multitude of misery which involves factors like handicapped children were killed on the name of racial purification, spread of tuberculosis leads of psychiatric damage and trauma among children. Their misery included family bre breakdown, loss of parents, abandonment, lack of educational opportunities, spiritual starvation and absolute breakdown of moral guidance. All the effects on children during World War II has left people around the world to realize that their these children need assistance, they need to be helped, they need to get to be taken care of as a result. Many organizations uh, like especially UNICEF has come forward and helped these children and helped them to recover after the aftermath of this war. All there, also there were scientists and clinicians who began study the effect or observe the effects of war on children. Two in particular were Anna Freud and her colleague Dorothy Berlingham who published a book called Children in War in 1942 which describes their observation about them. They ran some of the war nurseries for children who are affected by the war in Great Britain. During World War II it was really difficult to conduct a high quality research. This is obviously true when there is a situation like this. but. Still, there were brave scientists and clinicians who actually did the research and there are some striking lessons from these early observations during and after the war. First of all, they realized that there is a significant impact on children who are suffering from separation from their care caregiver. As for example, during bomb bombing in Great Britain, there were many children who were evacuated either into the countryside or to safer location above away from London and even in the across the ocean. But what was peculiar finding in these studies were that the children who were actually evacuated had more grief of separation from their parents than the trauma they have actually experienced. And also it can be seen that children who are, who even after evacuation were present with the caregiver, even with mother or father, one of the caregiver, these children show less traumatic reactions as compared to the one who were left alone. In this slide, we will talk about some important figures who were themselves are the victim of aftermath or consequences of World War II, but later they actually were founding researchers who contributed in the researches of landmark studies in resilience. 
The first one here is Norman Gramsci, who was a young soldier in World War II, and he was there in the infantry, and he took part in Battle of Bulge. After war, he went back to his home, the United States, and eventually became a clinical psychologist. He was very influential researcher and a teacher, and he was the one who began to study children at risk and turned his attention to resilience. He gained an international reputation for his early work in schizophrenia, among others, with his colleagues and graduate students, and launched what we today call as resilience theory which instead of focusing on pathology looked the aspect aspects such as cognitive skills motivation and other protective factors that might hold clues to preventing mental illness the other one here in the middle was one of the young children in europe who was profoundly affected by bombing and starvation that many children experienced in europe during world war 2 she was very famous in warner She was helped by many humanitarian agencies like UNICEF. Amy Warner grew up to become a developmental psychologist. She is best known in the field of child development for the leadership of a 40-year-old longitudinal study on infants on the Hawaiian island of Kauai. The study supported the conventional wisdom that many children exposed to reproductive and environmental risk factor go on to experience more problems with delinquency, mental and physical health and family stability than children exposed to fewer such risk factors. However, among Warner's most significant finding was the one third of all the high risk children displayed resilience and developed into a caring, competent and confident adult despite of these problematic developmental history finally sir michael ruter who is from great britain and one was one of the children in world war 2 he was among he was among those who was evacuated across the ocean of america where he stayed with the family for safety issues he grew up to became a very famous child psychiatrist and he was influential in the field of resilience he conducted a study on romanian population These three pioneers begin to study resilience with risk initially and later with adaptive factors. They are interested in the origin of mental illness or health problems. They study children at risk to try to understand how mental illness and other kinds of problem on the first place develop. All three started with study of risk initially but later on they realized that there was tremendous variation in the way children responded to great trauma and adversity. They had this important understanding that they all are spending time on studying just risk and problems and actually they were neglecting the study of children who were actually doing really well and recovering from the traumatic experiences. Meanwhile, they need to understand the processes that lead to positive outcome and recovery so that they will be able to help those children who are not recovering well from that same traumatic experience. After understanding this fact they emphasize on the scientists to actually focus in study in risk this study risk of those children who actually faced adversity The study of resilience has advanced in four major waves of research. In this slide, we will highlight the concept and findings resulting in emerging resilience framework for research and practice. The first wave of work yielded good description of resilience phenomena along with basic concepts and methodology and focused on the individual. The second wave yielded a more dynamic accounting of resilience adopting a developmental systems approach to theory and research on positive adaptation in the context of adversity or risk and focused on the transaction among individual and many systems in which their development is embedded the third wave focused on creating resilience by intervention directed at changing developmental pathways and finally the fourth wave now rising is focused on understanding and integrating resilience across multiple level of analysis with growing attention on epigenetic and neurobiological processes brain development and the ways that system interact to shape environment resilience research originated in two fields traumatology and developmental psychology early resilience research with adults focused on identifying what led led some individual to avoid traumatic stress in developmental psychology researchers aim to identify personal qualities ex- for example self esteem differentiating children who have adapted positively 
of who have adapted positively to socio-economic disadvantage abuse or neglect and catastrophic life events from children showing comparatively poorer outcomes the classic longitudinal study by Warner and Smith which we will learn in the subsequent slides of a large cohort of a disadvantaged children re re revolutionized psychology and pioneered a methodological paradigm for research re on resilience Warner and Smith in their seminal Kauai longitudinal study with a cohort of participants born in Hawaii in 1955 noted that resiliency of some children and shifted focus toward analyzing how these children benefited from family support, good coping and strong sense of values. We will talk in detail about the finding of this particular study in detail in our next segment. These and many other landmark researchers were crucial to providing empirical answers to questions raised within critical and humanist branches of psychological thought seeking to engage with meaning making, flourishing and growth. This was less a paradigm shift than a meaningful collaboration of disciplinary focus of psychopathology to explore the range of human experiences. However, the roots of resilience research show some limitation to the early approaches. Crystallizing resilience into a personality trait but positive psychological functioning in the realms of magical attainable only by extraordinary children who could weather any storm. Early research oversimplified adults' reaction to trauma and range of adaptive capabilities. Additionally, absence of psychopathology does not necessarily indicate that a person is striving to understand positive functioning researchers must specifically assess positive assets, resources and outcome. Finally, epidemiological approaches are necessary but insufficient. Psychology aims to enumerate the prevalence of different types of reactions only as much as its ultimate concern is to understand the why and how of human as they are in the world. Resilience research is informed by related disciplines including traumatology, developmental psycho psychopathology, positive psych psychology and humanistic psychology. There are increasingly intersections with health psychology and neurobiological psychology. Humanistic psychology philosophically underpins both positive psychology and the ethos of resilience research methods and area of focus which have been imported from traumatology and developmental psychology. In this slide, we may understand the key concepts for understanding resilience. Resilience is predicted on exposure to significant rather adversity and on the attainment of good outcome despite this exposure. Thus, identifying resilient pattern of adaptation requires op operationalization of several related concepts including competence, adversity, asset and risk. One by one, we grow, go through all these things individually and try to understand what will be incorporate in general first point which incorporate is required in resilience is competence which is conceptualized as adaptive use of resources both within and outside the organism to negotiate eight silent developmental changes and achieve positive outcomes thus in studies of resilience successful outcome are often evaluated in terms of track record of success in eight silent developmental tasks that individual in a particular society historical time and cultural co context expect children of a given age period to achieve thus in a western context the incompetent infant w is one who develops a secure at attachment in early caregiving relationship a competent adolescent will be one who succeed in areas of academic achievement and positive peer relationship and a competent adult any adult would be one who have successful transition into a romantic partnership and gainful employment next is adversity is which is actually um, opposite of competence which is uh, which means that it refers to negative experiences that have the potential to disrupt adaptive functioning or development adverse experiences may operate by temporarily overwhelming all the adaptive resources of an individual by damaging the adaptive capacity of an individual in short or long term or by undermining the development of individuals capacity system with lasting consequences 
Adversity may be acute, it can be natural disaster or technological disaster which has wide scale implication. Adversity may have chronic and ongoing consequences like a neglect of a child bully etc. arise within the environment. Example, interpersonal conflict or political violence or within a person it can be physiological like brain tumor or so. But on some level it has the potential to disrupt development and thought positive adaptation. We can understand asset and risk taking simultaneous example of each like for example when we talk about general population assets can be considered as resources and risk associated with positive and negative outcomes respectively. Assets refer to resources in a population that enhance the likelihood of positive developmental outcomes independent of risk status example good school, having good problem solving skills, family cohesion etc. Assets can take the form of human capital that is resource within the person or social capital that is resource stemming from connection and relationships with other people and social organization. Risk on the other hand refers to event or condition that increases the probability of an undesired outcome in a group of people with risk factor for example lady having, having a premature childbirth individual suffering from impoverished neighborhood or any certain bad articles exposure. Risk factor generally predicts worse outcome in a group of individuals who have the risk factor but not necessarily for early individual for every individual in the group. For example, very low birth weight is generally associated with a variety of developmental problems but many children go on to develop well despite a history of low birth weight. Assets and risks never occur in isolation in the real life of individual. They tend to pile up, leading to the lead idea of cumulative risk or asset. Risk and asset may counterbalance each other, such as a asset may cons compensate for risk, yielding a kind of net risk. A cumulative risk or adversity levels rise, positive outcome tend to decrease in frequency. Yet, even among individuals whose lives are marked by many risk and adversity, outcomes are often diverse with some individual exhibiting positive adaptation. The challenge to account for such variation has led to more complex interactive model of resilience that emphasize vulnerability and productive processes and development. Next con concept which act as a moderator between risk and assets are protective processes and vulnerabilities. Protective growth processes are related to positive outcomes and vulnerabilities are related to negative outcomes. At the level of the individual, protective and vulnerability factors moderate the effect of adversity on developmental outcomes whereas an asset as a comparably beneficial effect is in both high and low risk environment. A protective factor is disproportionately salient under conditions of adversity. Like when we take an example of this is that active parental monitoring and destructive rules may buffer young adolescents from the risk in dangerous neighborhood, but such monitoring is not necessary in a safe neighborhood and may even be detrimental to the development. Vulnerability factor is associated with negative outcome particularly when the individual is exposed to adversity. For example, children who encounter frightening and intrusive caregiving in infancy may fail to develop an organized pattern of relating to the caregiver. Identifying assets, risk protective factors and vulnerability is an important step in understanding resilience. However, to apply resilience framework in practice or policy we need to know much more about the process involved in resilience. In the next slide we may talk about the important studies, the landmark longitudinal studies in context of resilience. Thank you.